Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Gradient Podcast. We interview various people who research, build, or use AI, including academics, engineers, artists, entrepreneurs, and more. I'm your host, Andre Krenkov. In this episode, I'm excited to be interviewing Jeremy Howard. Jeremy Howard is a data scientist, researcher, developer, educator, and entrepreneur. Jeremy is a founding researcher at Fast.ai, a research institute dedicated to me making deep learning more accessible. He is also a distinguished research scientist at the University of San Francisco, the chair of WAMRY, and is chief scientist at Platform.ai. Previously, Jeremy was the founding CEO of Analytic, which was the first company to apply deep learning to medicine, was the president and chief scientist of the data science platform Kaggle, and was the founding CEO of two successful Australian startups. So a lot going on there, and I think you'll be excited for the conversation. So thank you so much for joining us for this interview, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Alrighty, so uh, as we tend to do on this podcast, I always like to hear how people first got into AI, and I think you have a slightly interesting path compared to a lot of people we talk to. So yeah, could you just get into how you started, uh, you know, working with AI and kind of discovering it? Sure. Um, so I started out in what today would be called data science, but in those days didn't really have a name. So about uh, 30 years ago, um, I worked at a management consulting company called um, McKinsey & Company. Um, In theory, I was meant to be an undergraduate at university, but in practice, I was working full time. and uh, yeah, I was an analytical specialist there. Um, so that meant I supported the consulting teams with whatever analysis they needed, which was sometimes kind of statistical or operations research or visualization or whatever. Um, and so the most uh, sophisticated machine learning I would do was pretty much just, you know, regression analysis. Um, but then I kind of got pretty interested in decision trees over the next few years and started getting into that some more. And um, uh, about 25 years ago, I started using neural networks a little bit for some kind of targeted marketing work. Um, so, yeah, I did a lot of different stuff in management consulting. Um, but then I really kind of focused on simulation and optimization <clears throat> for 10 years at a startup I started called um, Optimal Decisions, uh, which was focused on the insurance industry. Um, again, you know, doing some machine learning stuff, but that was mainly focused on, again, on kind of multivariate logistic regression, you know, and just using cubic, you know, cubic splines and stuff. Um, so then... Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Kaggle came along and um, um, at Optimal Decisions, I'd gotten really interested in random forests um, around the time that that paper first came out and um, thought I would try kind of using random forests in some Kaggle competitions and that worked out pretty well. Um, And then, you know, around 2012, um, I noticed that finally neural networks were really um, seemed to be living up to the promise I kind of thought they had had for decades. And um, so I started working pretty closely with with them until eventually, uh, yeah, I decided to to kind of work on that full time, initially in the medical space um, at Inlytic, um, and then more generally at Fast AI. Great. Yeah, that's really interesting kind of... Um you know, more of a practitioner uh, path than a researcher path, which we have a lot. And I guess you saw a lot of the more fundamental techniques like decision trees and random forests before all of this deep learning excitement happened. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's a very, very large amount of research. I mean, I spent most of my time doing research, but I was doing research in order to apply it to um, solving particular industrial problems. so I, I didn't find it any less research intensive than nowadays uh, that I am basically a full-time academic. 
Um, but it's just a different, uh, yeah, different way of doing that research, I guess. Yeah, I guess van result is different, even if yeah. a lot of the process is similar. Exactly. And I'm curious, how did you get into Kaggle? Because it's an interesting path where you were, you know, a globally top ranked participant for a while and then ended up as the president and chief scientist, which uh, yeah, is, so, <laughs> sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, it was good. I mean, I was lucky that um, it had been started in my hometown in Melbourne, Australia. And um, I, yeah, basically bumped into the founder at, a, at an R meetup. And, um, yeah, he knew I, who I was cause I was top ranked on the platform at that time. And I said, I thought it was really cool platform. And I, um, basically I helped out as a volunteer, um, quite a bit. So initially restructuring the database, which I'd noticed was kind of not organized very well. Um, and, um, that made things a lot faster. And then I looked at the actual code and, actually ended up rewriting all the code from scratch. Um, initially it was in PHP and I rewrote it in C sharp and yeah, I kind of obviously got to the point where I couldn't really just be a volunteer <laughs> much longer. <laughs> so Sounds like you did had, a lot. Had written the database and the code. Uh, so, so. Then you, yeah, it made sense for you to, uh, join in and, and what yeah, and I also became a, I also was, a, I also was the first, uh, first investor in it as well. So I'd kind of put in oh. my money and my time. So what did you find appealing about it, both as a participant and just generally, what did you like about the platform? Well, I love competitions, you know, competitions in, in sports and elsewhere, uh, push human performance to the limits. You know, um, people, people like me who are highly competitive, seek out competitive opportunities and go hard to, to try and win. And uh, then people push each other and, um, you know, so competitions are really fun, but they also drive human performance like, like nothing else. So I'm a huge believer in machine learning and predictive modeling is a powerful tool and a huge believer in the power of competition. Um, you know, the um, KDD cups had been going on for a while and I thought they were great. And the Netflix prize was, you know, super cool. Um, so I was, you know, really loved the opportunity to, to both compete uh, and also then to, to support a platform which can, you know, uh, one, of, one of the things I really liked about it was to really make data scientists into, into stars. You know, people would be like, oh, yeah, this person won these competitions, particularly for somebody like me who I've really um, don't like the kind of ivory tower exclusive world. So I've kind of tried to avoid exclusive universities or doing an advanced degree. I don't have a PhD or anything. I really liked, you know, the idea that this is something that regardless of your background, people can, you know, show what they can do. Right. And you can just by showing that you perform well, you know, be recognized just for, yeah, your it doesn't matter if you're, um, yeah, it doesn't matter what, university you went to or if you didn't go to one at all or you know whether you're male or female or black or white or what part of the world you're from or whether you know the right people um you are judged on your performance just like if you're a, a golfer or a tennis player and uh actually i think i guess I, I assume people here know what kaggle is but maybe to take a step back uh can you describe what it was back when you started and maybe what it has evolved to when you were there or since then? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's first and foremost a, a competition platform. Initially it was only a competition platform. So it's somewhere that the people that have a problem to solve, um, a predictive modeling problem to solve, um, provide data to people who are going to have a crack at solving it. Um, some of the data, some of the labels are held back as it tests it. Uh, well, actually, two sets. There's a there's a kind of a, 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 a initial private test set um, during the competition, and then a second private test set that is used once off at the very end of the competition. Um, and yeah, anybody can download that data and try and build a predictive model, make predictions, upload those predictions, and um, whoever's predictions are the most accurate on that uh, second held out secret test set. Um, wins a prize. And sometimes that prize could be, you know, tickets to a conference, 
And sometimes that prize could be over a million dollars. It just depends on the on the competition. Yes, uh, that's yeah. I think that's very cool. I've I've wanted to play around with it for a long time, and it's just you know, one of a million things uh, would be exciting to do. So I yeah, I highly it. recommend that that everyone try to like do one or two competitions sometime during their education or career, and like put their all into it for three months because you know, at least from from my point of view, and lots of people I've spoken to it's a amazing learning experience regardless of whether you do well, you know, or not. If you, if you don't do well, um, that gives you a great insight into like, well, well, why not, you know, and what could you do better next time? And then you can have a second, you know, do a second competition and try and do better. And if you do do well, it teaches you something about, you know, what, what worked well. It requires, you know, very strong software engineering skills because over a three month period, you know, if you're working on it every day, it, your code's going to get totally messy if you don't structure it well. Um, and it requires a very pragmatic approach and it requires creativity. Um, so, yeah, I find it's um, a really great self-development opportunity. Definitely. And uh, I'm curious, uh, looking back, do you have any kind of competitions that you find memorable or maybe like highlights in your own experience and where you were president as well? One of the things I really thought was interesting and kind of fun um, in hosting competitions or or helping the hosts of competitions is how almost universally um, the hosts would um, strongly believe that no competitor would be able to um, kind of beat the current best practice. Because generally speaking, the current best practice would be something that had been developed over decades by specialists. Um, so, you know, we had, and you know, the competitions could be pretty tricky. There are things like, uh, um, mapping dark matter in the universe by, uh, kind of reverse engineering gravitational lensing was one or, um, coming up with an algorithm to automatically grade student essays was another. Um, and as you can imagine, these are the kinds of things that, that, yeah, they have real domain experts studying them for years. Um, but every single time we ran a competition that I remember, the you know the best previous approach would be beaten within a day or two. And uh, so it's kind of interesting to see the, the the competition hosts go from like, oh, we should find ways to simplify this competition because nobody's going to be able to handle it because you know these are just amateurs that don't understand this domain. And then after a day or two, they'd be like, oh my God, somebody has just revolutionized our industry. How the hell did they do that? <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I guess another thing that I'm curious about is just from looking over it a little bit, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of forums, a lot of people who spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. So do you think there's also like a community aspect to it? And yeah, sort of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we always had um, discussion forums pretty much from the start. And uh, I was a big proponent of that because I've always been, um, you know, used discussion forums a lot, going all the way back to Usenet um, over 30 years ago, um, news groups. And um, my email company, Fastmail, uh, had a very busy, popular public forum for our, for our users. So yeah, every um, every um, competition uh, has and always has had a um, a discussion forum attached to it, which is great because you know it's not just that people can ask for organizers for th- questions, but they can talk to each other. And then an interesting addition in the past few years has been uh, that Kaggle also has a uh, hosted Jupyter no- notebook platform. So people can have not just discussions, but can also have uh, about, you know, just about prose, but they can also upload notebooks and have discussions about those as well, which can be attached to a competition or totally independent. That's, yeah, really interesting. And that reminds me also, uh, having played around a little bit, I want to get noticed more recently, is there is also a possibility that 
you use their hosted data set, and I believe they also provide compute in some cases. So in some sense, it is democratizing the ability to learn AI and experiment with things without having access to compute or storage or any of these things. Yeah, to some extent, that's true. I mean, um, I would say kind of CoLab is the main platform that's done that, um, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, Kaggle does, uh, does a bit of that as well. Uh, although, yeah, in practice, I find uh, the vast majority of people use CoLab for that. And for our, for our courses, we push, we, you know, point people towards CoLab for that. Yes, and I think a lot of our listeners also love Colab, and and we'll get to more of the this topic of democratization with fast AI, of course. But before that, um, after uh, Kaggle, you went on to start uh, Analytic, of course, mm-hmm. and as we said in the beginning, uh, it dealt with it, it dealt with applying deep learning to medicine. So. What, what was your process of kind of coming up with that and realizing deep learning was this big deal that could be applied to something like medicine? Well, I had guessed that neural nets were going to kind of take over, um, I'm trying to think, you know, over 25 years ago. Because um, they just seemed to have the, you know, the fundamentals were there that, it, that they just didn't have the limitations that, that other techniques had that was so flexible. Um, so in 2012, um, you know, particularly with the stuff coming out of um, Jürgen Schmidt Huber's lab, um, was that was when I started thinking, okay, they've they're reaching that point where they're going to start taking over. Um, and then we started seeing them winning more and more Kaggle competitions. Uh, so, you know, I was, I was, I, and I'd always promised myself that when I, when I saw that happening, I would dive into it. So I did. Um, and to, I took a year off to research the question of where is deep learning going to have the biggest impact in the short to medium term? Um, and then I'll work on that. And so during that research, one of the areas I studied was, um, you know, study doesn't look into for this was medicine. And I realized that medicine, a lot of medicine involved basically data analysis, um, but analysis of the kind of data that previously computers hadn't been particularly good at analyzing, uh, like images and natural language. And I thought, okay, well, this is going to be pretty transformative. Um, so that was why I decided to start analytic to help bring about that transformation. And my main goal was to show people um, what might be possible uh, by combining, you know, bringing deep learning to medicine and to try to kind of launch that as a, as a field of, of, you know, research and development. Which, yeah, is, is now definitely a field. Definitely, of research yeah. And, and at, the time, at the time, it wasn't at all, you know, like, Nothing was happening, and I was really yeah, surprised. This was uh, what twenty fourteen ish, or yeah. So the, the research was happening during twenty thirteen, and then the initial development during twenty fourteen. So, yeah, when I was going to conferences around medical image computing and stuff like that, there was no neural nets whatsoever. Wow. Yeah, I, f- I guess this was still when there's more computer vision applied to object recognition, whatever, but not yet medicine, which is another yeah. domain. Yeah, it's just like that, you know, just hadn't, it was just a group of people that didn't have any background in that area and they didn't really know it was, it was happening. Um, and, and, you know, also to be clear, at that time, 2013, 2014, most computer vision researchers I spoke to in any field uh, were still not using neural nets. You know, it was the early days of that um, transition, which which then happened incredibly quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sort of started happening around the early 2010s, but it took a while for it to be universal. <laughs> well, not that long, but still. Well, yeah, and in, in the early 2010s, there wasn't much that anybody could do because the the software wasn't available. Mm-hmm. So um, Dan Sirison in Jürgen Smithhofer's lab you know, created his own uh, CUDA library 
But that was not publicly available. That was this commercial thing you had to buy. Um, so it wasn't until, you know, stuff like Cafe and Theano came out that um, that people could actually do research into this unless they were going to go and create their own, write their own CUDA kernel, you know, like, um, like uh, Krajewski did, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and is that something you had to do getting into it? No, it's um, you know I, I in the early days of my optimization simulation work, I, we did a lot of um, C plus plus stuff, but I've I've tried to stay away from it because um, there's so much kind of engineering overhead working at that level. Um, mm-hmm. So I've decided, you know, I kind of. One of the things I was waiting for is for there to be some kind of uh, freely available GPU accelerated um, linear algebra library. Um, and so, yeah, it was really when Theano came out that I started diving into the coding myself. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And certainly, I think a lot of PhD students <laughs> these days appreciate that uh, being the case. Yeah, I mean, working. Uh, you know, at the CUDA level, it's just, there's just so much messing around with, you know, memory and transfers and handling all this looping stuff and whatever. It's, yeah, it's just not something I want to spend my time doing. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, I think a lot of students can relate. We just use a lot of libraries these days and that makes yeah. things a lot easier. It sounds like, uh, I'm curious, yeah, what kind of you did at Analytic and what Analytic does. It sounds like there's some image analysis. Is that kind of a main thing or were there also other uh, problems? In medicine? Um, yeah, I mean, so we started in, um, in uh, on the image side. Um, because that was kind of the low-hanging fruit. But, you know, yeah, we pretty quickly got into um, natural language processing stuff. Um, you know, by that stage, we were getting pretty deep on radiology. So even the NLP we were doing was around radiology reports. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, and then kind of multimodal. Um, yeah, we did, yeah, definitely started looking beyond computer vision pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And I find that interesting personally, because from what I understand, one of the big difficulties with research on medicine, at least, I don't know if it's still the case, but early on and to some extent still is access to data. So with computer vision, you have a lot of data, NLP, you have these data sets, but with medicine, it's a little more uh, difficult. Well, that's the... That's the difference between research in academia and research in industry. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was not a problem for us because we were working with hospitals and hospitals have lots of data. Um, the issue is that um, they, you know, they can't really release that very well to, to the public, um, but they're very happy to have um, private relationships and development done on that data. Yeah. And then I guess, um, did you find that the techniques you were trying, uh, computer vision, NLP, led to sort of the sort of advancements you would have expected, or were there a lot of challenges getting going on that? Um, the NLP progress didn't really happen for me until after I left Analytic um, when I um, created ULM Fit, because um, you know, really, all there was was some was basically some word vectors and some you know um, first word to vec and then love and some pretty basic ways of using them, which actually didn't get us very far. Um, and I always thought it was weird that nobody was using the same techniques we were using in computer vision um, in NLP. But it wasn't until I left Analytic that I, you know, as a CEO, I just didn't have the time to do that kind of research. Um, but, you know, after, one of the first things I did actually, you know, after leaving um, Analytic was to start to look into that question of, of NLP, which led to the development of ULM fit and, um, you know, fine-tuned, fine-tuned language models. 
Yeah, one of the early examples of what is now sort of a universal <laughs> practice in NLP of yeah, training a lot of data and fine tuning, somewhat like yeah. ImageNet. Yeah. yeah, it was the it was the second to do it. The first was Diane Lee uh, from Google, but the key thing with them is they um, didn't figure out how to make it work with a kind of a, a generic pre-trained um, corpus. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so we were so Sebastian and I were the first to show that you could actually just you pre-train on Wikipedia and get great results. Okay, yeah, and that's certainly kind of maybe an underrated uh, step in this whole journey of NLP uh, that I can recall. Uh, but uh, one more thing on Analytic before we sort of move on to, to the future. Um, you mentioned that in all these conferences on um, image analysis for medicine, they were not using neural nets. Uh, but there were, of course, these established techniques for, I presume, decades with a lot of experts. Hmm. So... Um, did you find that compared to those techniques, it was, you know, deep learning really made a switch as it had for computer vision and, and other problems kind of right oh, away? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I found this fit for, for every domain pretty much. I mean, so one, one example, um, you know, early on within Lytic, um, you know, we were looking at hiring. And at that point, I was still strongly considering starting with uh, histopathology rather than radiology. Um, and so we were bringing in researchers to talk to them about their work and see if we, we could hire them. And so we brought in a chap who I think is just finishing up his PhD uh, in um, medical image computing around histopathology. And um, yeah, he came to talk to us about his work and we did a presentation and he talked about, yeah, basically how during his PhD, he had spent five years creating this um, kind of sophisticated uh, graph cut based approach, which uh, was pretty interesting. And then at the end, I asked him, you know, if, you know, he'd have considered using neural nets. And he said, no, he hadn't until the day before he came to visit us. <laughs> um, and he thought he might just check it out because it seemed like an interesting thing to do since he was going to come and talk to us and he knew we were into neural nets. And uh, he said within four, hour, within four hours, he had beaten the best result he'd ever gotten his PhD. Wow. <laughs> so he was actually feeling quite deflated he, uh, about that. He learned a bitter lesson, right? Yeah. yeah. And I find that happens, yeah, most times uh, somebody says to me they've decided to try using deep learning on something where they've previously used kind of domain specific hacks, um, they generally get, yeah, much better results. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly why, you know, these days a lot of people think AI is synonymous with machine learning and, and deep learning, although maybe it's not quite that simple, but it's, it's just so powerful. Yeah. And speaking of it being powerful, uh, I guess, moving on, next you went out to fast.ai. And I imagine, you know, your experience seeing a power of deep learning was, it was part of the motivation. But uh, yeah, can you just uh, describe what was your thinking process when you decided yeah. to go and, and do this? So my, my wife is a math PhD, much more in the kind of pure math side and I were talking as you can imagine we're talking a lot about deep learning and we really noticed that um, it was a very exclusive community at that time um, there wasn't really any great ways to learn deep learning and the majority of the tricks that kind of make it work well in practice weren't actually being written down in academic papers so we were finding out about them through kind of word of mouth, basically chatting to to, to researchers directly. Yeah, um, famously dirty bag of tricks, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that kind of stuff, exactly. Um, and, you know, there was really just kind of five main labs that were, were doing it. Um, and it was, yeah, you know, the, and the, like talking to the folks, I, I was mainly obviously familiar with the folks from Berkeley and Stanford. And, uh, you know, talking to them, it, you know, they just weren't really working on 
a range of problems that I thought were particularly impactful. They they were pretty focused on organizing photo, uh, photo libraries, for example, mm -hmm. and not very focused on questions of like access to water or, you know, access to education or, you know, any, any of the kind of key Millennium Development Goals or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, the issue was it was just a group of people who they were solving the problems that they had, um, but not the, really the, the big problems the world has. And so we kind of thought, well, how do we get this incredibly powerful tool being used by people that can really help make society better? Um, and we thought the way to do that would be to make, to try to get get it so that the, the domain experts, the people that really understand the problems and have access to the data and understand the constraints and understand the implementation issues, try and make it so that they can harness deep learning as part of what they're doing. Um, and, you know, another big part of that was thinking um, historically when there's major technology shifts, it tends to increase inequality, at least for a few decades, um, and le you know, and during that time, often leads to a, a kind of decrease in median um, kind of uh, uh, economic uh, situations. Um, and we were worried about this, this the scale of the te technology shift that was coming, and that this could really yeah, this could really be bad for society in terms of increasing inequality and all the problems that that we know that leads to. Um, so yeah, so that, so we started um, Fast AI on this mission of improving the accessibility of deep learning, um, which we didn't know whether that was possible or to what degree that was possible. You know, at the time. Really, everybody doing anything with deep learning had PhDs from pretty much one of the five main labs, and um, you know, were super kind of super mathy technical people. Um, but we thought, I don't know, we kind of thought like, well, there's nothing fundamentally difficult about this technology. We think there'd be ways to make it easier and more accessible. So let's see how far we can go. Yeah, and uh, I guess just to mention uh, with regards to this. Uh, Fast AI, it's very important to note that it was co-founded by you and Dr. Rachel Thomas. That's right. Uh, just for our listeners. Uh, and Dr. Rachel Thomas, also super impressive. And I, I've learned a lot from reading uh, her blog posts. Cool. Uh, yeah, so Rachel, yeah, so Rachel's my wife. So she was the person I was mentioning before with the, yep. with the math PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, we decided to... Um, try and create this thing together which apart from anything else it's like starting something with your spouse is always a bit <laughs> worrying <you know>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, hoped, we hoped we wouldn't drive each other crazy or something but it actually worked out really well interesting yeah so yeah so i think early on uh as you said it wasn't too obvious how to go about it and i believe one of your early uh things uh now it's expanded but uh, as far as i heard it was initially sort of a class a uh, massive yeah. open online course uh practical deep learning for coders uh so how did you go about developing that class yeah kind of, how did that yeah, turn into so class today so the way I've been thinking about it throughout this time, and I still do, is um, is basically like the internet. Um, so I remember when I first got in the internet, and I was probably 17 or 18. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, 30 years ago. And you couldn't do it without first being, you know, pretty familiar with the TCP IP stack and configuration files and bash scripting and, you know, quite quite a range of fairly arcane technical details. And when you did all that, then you would, you know, be able to, you know, send FTP commands or whatever. Like even at that point, it's like using the internet was not particularly straightforward. Um, but nowadays, you know, my, my mom happily uses the internet on her phone without really any significant training. Um, and so my view is, we, we want to get to the same point with, with deep learning, you know, that it's something that 
that everybody just uses without really knowing anything too much about what's going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need a lot more of the education to get there. In the end, it's mainly going to be about software development and and um, and the research behind that to figure out what that software needs to do. Um, but we thought we shouldn't start there. Um, first of all, we should figure out like what's possible with the current technology we have right now, you know, the current state of the research and the current state of the software. Um, And so that's why we decided to start with the education um, to basically see, see how far that could go. Um, So we thought, all right, let's build a course, which, you know, has the, lowest prerequisites we can have, uh, you know, that we can, uh, but also like the, the, the one thing we, we didn't want to compromise on was that at the end of the course, you should be able to like really practically train world-class models that were actually useful. Um, so we thought, yeah, let's see how far we can go. So we basically decided let's try to do it with just a high school math prerequisite um, and a year of coding prerequisite and see what we could do. And we were, to be honest, um, pretty nervous that we would end up looking like idiots because <laughs> the pretty much the universal belief was that this was something you needed a PhD to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't, we weren't at all sure this was even possible. Um, but yeah, we did the best we could and, and um did a lot of research into like, well, what things actually work and kind of started realizing that, um, well, we, we kind of already knew a bit from from my time at Analytic that transfer learning in particular was something that could really improve the accessibility of deep learning by requiring less compute and less data. Um, and so we decided early on to focus pretty hard on that. Um, and we also decided to focus pretty hard on a kind of a code first approach rather than a math first approach because worldwide there's a lot more people who work closely every day with code than there are who work closely every day with math. So we wanted to reach that bigger audience of people. Um, and we also decided to do a lot of research into um, into learning itself, human learning, um, which is where we came across this uh, research into the idea that, that top-down based approaches um, are more effective for most students than the bottom-up approaches that, that universities generally use. Um, so we also decided to do that. So that's how we came up with this uh, top-down code-first um, uh, approach that we still use today. Interesting. Yeah, I, I found it kind of uh, intriguing that, uh, I don't know, it's a story that one of the first, really the first big massive open online course was machine learning by Andrew Ng that in some sense, as far as I know, pioneered it. And I took that course and it is the opposite. It takes a very math first approach to machine learning and uh, is, is interesting, but is is not accessible if you're a coder in it. Yeah. So curiously, actually, two two courses pioneered at the same time. The other one was um, Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thrun's uh, AI course. Um, so yeah, they were the kind of the first two MOOCs. It might've been a database one too. I can't remember that. Yeah, they were the first two big MOOCs. And um, yeah, so Rachel and I like took every course we could find and read every book we could find. So, you know, we both did the Andrew Ong course and really liked it. You know, he's a great teacher and a great guy. Um, and we kind of thought, yeah, we want to create something as good as this, but top down, you know, and in Python. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. Also sort of kind of the natural instincts of, uh, academia or, uh, universities is to, you know, be more mathy, be more theory, uh, in many cases, Stanford is a little different, but still. I guess being outside of universities to some extent uh, or or having a different view helped with taking a different approach from, you know, what is usually done. Yeah. And, you know, I will say um, another thing that came out 
just before fast AI's um, first uh, first course uh, was um, um, Stanford's uh, CS two thirty one N, and that actually was much closer. I think that came out before a fast AI's first course. I think um, the first iteration was twenty fifteen, and I, yeah. I don't know if it was public, but yeah, around that yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. The, the, in terms of the public one that that Andre did. Um, and uh, that that was actually much closer to what we were trying to do. You know, it actually had quite a lot of really practical advice around what actually works and what actually doesn't work, and and so forth. Um, and then another course that was interesting uh, around that time was uh, Nando de Freitas did uh, an Oxford course, which was um, more like a kind of postgraduate version of uh, Andrew Ng's course. Um, Super mathy, but also, you know, really nicely done. One of the nice things about Nando's course was he really focused on the importance of kind of the layer as an abstraction and the idea of like once you've got that, you can kind of then put these layers together. Now, he did that in terms of mathematically rather than code. Um, but, yeah, all of these were very helpful resources for us as we as we built our first course. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that Two for Your Own End is, is pretty legendary and, and still an amazing course. And so, yeah, getting going with that first iteration, I'm curious, how did it go? <laughs> you know, how many people did you have? And then, sure. So, um, I I really like um, teaching live human beings, um, but I also really like the high leverage of of a MOOC. So the approach I used was to um, record me teaching an in-person course. So the in-person course was at the University of San Francisco, and uh, they were super helpful just with like handling all the logistics of that without getting in the way at all, you know, which is exactly what you want from university administration. It's like get, get rid of the crap that you don't want, but don't limit what you're trying to do. So they were great. Um, and so I ended up teaching, I, I'm pretty sure the first one was was full, but we didn't have a very big room. So I think it was about 120 people, um, which is much more than I expected. Um, and then um, I'm trying to remember. So then also... Um, so yeah, then we create, you know, we had forums for the course and um, put the recordings online. And um, what really blew me away in terms of like, was this working? Was when I created a forum thread that said, um, you know, after lesson one or two, if you, you know, if you have created your own model using what you've learned, reply here with a link to us and, t and tell us about it. And um, yeah, we got over a thousand responses of people who had built really cool things. Wow. Um, <laughs> and interestingly, because they didn't know what was meant to be possible or not possible, they tried things which I thought wouldn't work. Um, so one of the very first ones, if not the first one, was uh, something that could recognize pictures of cricket from pictures of baseball. And um, if I remember correctly, he used... 30 images in total. And I, I would never have thought to try so few, um, but he got over 99% accuracy on a held out set of data. Um, and I was just like, wow, that's amazing. And then another guy did something which um, looked at satellite imagery and predicted what um, what city or what region a satellite image was from. Um, and again, that was something, you know, with from like over 80 different regions. Um, it's a super hard problem, um, pretty high cardinality um, dependent variable, but he still got over 80% accuracy. Um, yeah, so that was when we kind of, and, and, and also like hearing the um, backgrounds of the people, or, you know, basically none of them were math or computer science PhDs. Um, they were generally people who were like they often had PhDs in something, but but they'd be in like fields like I don't know English literature or astrophysics or, or whatever, um, and also just a lot of people who were just 
in industry, but you know, they were like CTOs of really cool startups or um, people who were pioneers in data journalism or so like a lot of interesting people took that first course and um, yeah, really showed us like, oh, cool. You actually don't need a PhD in, in math or computer science and you actually can create, uh, you know, really cool models. Lots of people actually compared stuff they were doing to academic papers and discovered that they had created a new academic state of the art after like the first or second class. It was quite remarkable. Yeah. And that was, that was hugely exciting. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, you know, it's, I, f I can relate a little bit in that, uh, Stanford often, um, you know, in, in ending their CS classes in the second half, has this project thing where you don't do mm. homeworks. You just, you just pick a project and do it, which I always really love and have enjoyed doing. So I'm mm. curious, did you have a homework uh, or something like that? Or did people just decide to do these sorts of things? Yeah, no, we, we, we do. I mean, the homework's more like the Stanford homework. It's, it's basically like, okay, you know, pick, pick a data set and try to build a model and, you know, it's just, it's the same today. A little today. more structured, yeah. It's it's like you you you've got to download your own data. You got to decide what problem to solve, um, and decide why it's interesting, and decide how to clean the data, and decide how to present it. And um, and nowadays we get them to create a web app and deploy it as as well. Um, so the idea is basically like, yeah, actually create something that you think's going to be fun or interesting in some way. Yeah, which. I always find it amazing that uh, it seems like not many other courses do that because no. it's just so fantastic for learning. Yeah, it's also great for like a portfolio, like particularly for folks who haven't been to a highly regarded school. Um, how do you how do you get noticed? You know, how do you get a job? And um, having a good portfolio is really the key way to do that and so if during that learning time you were building cool projects you can you can show them off and I, we found that seems to work pretty well mm. yeah for sure and, and that reminds me i know of one case of someone who got into ai and deep learning through facet ai uh, helena serene who we interviewed uh, one of the first people maybe the first person Great. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. So I wonder if you have any other kind of success stories that you're proud of as far as people who got into it and then went on to do really impressive things or, or some. Oh, like God, that. yeah. I mean, you know, hundreds or thousands. I, I, you know, I'm not sure I want to pick out too many names specifically because there's, there's, you know, there's so many great people. I mean. But it launched um, many careers, I can imagine. Uh, oh, yeah. Like when I yeah. went, when I last went to Europe, so many people came up to me and said, oh, I've just presented my paper and I wanted to thank you because I got my start through fast AI, you know. Um, so like certainly a lot of researchers. Um, and interestingly, yeah, I moved to Australia in February and when I got here, I was told like the, 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 the city I'm in, which is a city of like three or 4 million people, Brisbane, uh, the folks here told me that the entire AI community here basically started up through doing fast AI courses wow. through a meetup together. And there's now a whole Queensland AI hub. Um, you know, folks like, um, uh, Christine McLevy Payne, who's now at open AI, you know, built MuseNet, no really cool music stuff. Um, you know, she started building those projects um, while she was studying fast AI. Um, yeah, there's just uh, there's just so many, and it's um, it's exciting. Uh, every few days, I get a email from somebody who says that um, you know, and I really love it when I get these emails saying, "Oh, you know, I just launched my startup, or I just got my first job, or whatever," um, mm -hmm. using deep learning and started it with your course and. Thanks very much. And that's, yeah, it's, it's super cool. I love yeah, it. Yeah. It sounds like your initial goal of really enabling people to get into it and use deep learning, as you said, uh, in some sense, to some extent, you've definitely succeeded based on these stories. I, I don't feel that way. I feel like we've really? made a good step, um, but um, we still need code. Um, and that, that actually rules out most of society. 
Um, so we've still got a long way to go. Um, it still requires, you know, really at least 70 hours of study. For a lot of people, honestly, it's it's more like a year. Um, so it's also like requires a lot of tenacity um, and time. Uh, so I feel like we've still got another, you know, decade of work at least ahead of us. You started, but there's still a lot more. And uh, on that note, uh, as you mentioned, it started with lessons and, and this class, but you since then have done a lot more, in particular releasing this uh, mm -hmm. open source library, mm -hmm. Fast AI. So how does that fit in? Why did you think that was really needed to, mm. you know, as part of a mission? So that's really our key goal is is to get everything into software such that you shouldn't need any or shouldn't need much training at all. Um, and so there, we basically have a, a an iterative loop we go through each year where we do a course, you know, do two talk, we do two courses. We f look at that and we say, okay, well, what things are still hard to learn, or what things re require a lot of data, or what things require a lot of compute? You know, so what where are the where are the constraints to accessibility? Uh, and then we go through um, and do research to try to figure out how to lower those bars? How do we make something less complicated, um, less finicky, take less time, take less compute? Um, and then we um, take the results of that research and, and put it into software. So try to um, create, you know, put into the fast AI library things that are going to mean that in, you know, by the time the next course comes around, um, we can teach more stuff more quickly to people with fewer prerequisites and have them create better outcomes. And then once yeah. we do that, the loop starts again. So really <laughs> the fast AI library is the um, most important piece of this puzzle because that's the thing which hopefully at the end of this process, the software is really all we're going to need. We won't, we won't need much of a course, if any. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Personally, of course, I know, you know, now is standard to use frameworks and research. It's typically PyTorch, you know, something that used to be TensorFlow. Mm. So how would you compare Fast AI to these maybe typically more uh, academically used things like PyTorch? Oh, I mean, to be clear, um, Fast AI is very heavily used in academia. So it's... Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, so FastAI sits on top of PyTorch right. and it's designed to allow researchers and practitioners to focus on the the piece of the puzzle that that they care about. Mm -hmm. um, so for beginners starting out, um, it's really helpful to use the FastAI library because you can just get better results much more quickly because, you know, all the, you know, a single line of code is going to have a whole lot of research behind it into best practices and make sure everything's done correctly for you in terms of like, you know, how do you fine tune batch norm layers or what kind of learning rate schedule should you use or you right. know, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, the uh, black magic. Yeah, all the black magic, which, you know, and, and honestly, this black magic, most of the stuff in fast AI has appeared, you know, before it appears in any academic papers. Um, right. It's much, you know, honestly, it's much easier to come up with an idea and implement and code than go through all the hassle of <laughs> turning it into a published paper, which yeah. I like. I don't, I don't like writing papers. Um, but yeah, then as you want to dig further into it to figure out like, oh, well, why, you know, it's not working very well on you know, object detection of background or it's, you know, it's too slow at inference or we needed to handle unbalanced data better or, you know, you'll have some issue. And then you would use fast AI because it allows you to then focus on just that thing. You know, you don't have to rewrite your whole training loop and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so you'll still have all the other best practices. You're just swapping out the one piece that you care about. And then the other nice thing is that it's extremely modular, um, so it's it's a decoupled API where you can um, basically plug together 
any pieces you like and you can be basically guaranteed they'll work correctly together. So you could have, uh, you know, a, um, a unit, for example, for doing segmentation and you could plug in a pre-trained ResNet 34 backbone on the, you know, on the um, downsampling path. And then when you train it, you could decide to add mix up and um, mixed precision training and, you know, weights and biases uh, uh, logging. And so you just, you know, each one of those is just like one line of code to say, add this thing, add this thing and add this thing. And they all work together. Um, which is great for both researchers and and practitioners, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, because it's all sitting on top of PyTorch, um, you can yeah add add your own PyTorch code anywhere, or you can take something that's already written in PyTorch and gradually replace bits of it with stuff from Fast AI um, in order to you know basically give yourself less less code to maintain and take advantage of more of these uh, built-in best practices, um, but kind of do it do it gradually so that you're always in control of that process. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah, so definitely a great overview on Fasted AI, which is a fantastic resource to get cited as, as one of the best ones. And then just to wrap up, uh, I always like to finish with this question, which is going outside of AI, outside of your career, what are some things that you do in your spare time? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? Maybe your primary Ah, ones. Well, that's easy. My primary interest is my nearly six-year-old daughter. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Yes. um, Becoming a father was by far the best thing that's ever happened in my life. And I am incredibly lucky to be able to spend a lot of time with, with my daughter. Um, and she's, uh, yeah, she's very interesting and she's very interested, um, in stuff. And, um, it's been fun watching her, watching her learn, um, cause I'm obviously very interested in both human learning and, and in machine learning. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that brings a lot of, uh, joy and interest to my life. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And yeah, I've heard some other yeah, researchers have that. Of, it's fascinating seeing this, you know, human learner and, and how, how powerful mm. it is. Right. Mm. Well, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and close out. Uh, that was a really interesting interview for me. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking the time for it. My pleasure. And then our quick outro. Once again, this is the Gradient Podcast. Check out our associated magazine over at thegradient.pub. If you enjoyed this interview, please support us by sharing this podcast with your friends, subscribing, and reviewing it as, as you do for any podcast. Thank you for listening, and be sure to tune in to our future episodes.